the aim of my talk today is to uh, shortly review what progress has been made in understanding the formation and the orbital evolution of planetary systems thanks to the uh, many exoplanets that have been discovered by the uh, transit methods. Um, so first I would like to uh, highlight what are the major observational constraints that transit methods have brought us. And so first, uh, transit methods have led to uh, discovering many misaligned hot Jupiters that uh, we've already heard about uh, yesterday. And so I would say that these uh, discoveries have reinstated uh, dynamical processes uh, as uh, likely processes that shape uh, planetary systems. And I would also say that these have uh, shown the importance of better understanding star-planet tidal interactions when trying to model the orbital evolution of short period planetary systems. Um, and uh, secondly, uh, in particular, Kepler has uh, uncovered a large population of Earth to Neptune mass objects that are part of compact multiplanetary systems. And these are very interesting because uh, they have, uh, well, raised the question of whether these guys could have formed in situ as an uh, alternative route to the uh, so-called standard paradigm for disk migration. So we'll touch a few words about that. And uh, certain binary planets have also been detected, which can be seen as uh, cases for uh, planet formation under some extreme uh, conditions. And uh, well, lastly, planets have also been detected around Portsmouth sequence stars, which does show the importance of taking stellar physics and stellar evolution into account when uh, trying to model the evolution of planetary systems. And so amongst these four highlights, those that I will focus on today are the first two, so the misaligned heart Jupiters and uh, Kepler's uh, multiplanetary systems. So talking about uh, misaligned heart Jupiters, so what constraint did we get from uh, measuring planets' obliquities? So the first thing uh, to remind is that uh, what observations give access to is the sky projection of a planet's obliquity, that is the uh, angle between the uh, planet's orbital axis and the stellar spin axis. And so in the recent years, this has been traditionally obtained via the rossiter mclaughlin flag, which we heard about yesterday, which is this uh, anomalous blue shift and red shift superimposed to the stellar reflex motion in the uh, radial velocity curve during transit. Uh, but other methods have also been used, like, uh, for instance, the analysis of star spot occultations during transit. Um, and I will also point out that under such special conditions, it is uh, possible to actually constrain the true obliquity when uh, having access to the inclination of the stellar spin axis relative to the line of sight, which can be done, for instance, through a soros seismology. So, um, the uh, sky projected misalignment angle has now been obtained for about 60 uh, planets so far. These are mainly for hot Jupiters with orbital pairs below 10 days. And they are displayed in this plot uh, as a function of the star's effective temperature. As one can be seen, there is some observational trend that hot Jupiters around hot stars tend to have higher obliquities. And these uh, observations have had considerable impact for models of planetary evolutions since they have highlighted that uh, dynamical processes that can lead to high uh, planet's obliquity or planet inclinations can be actually quite common in shaping uh, planetary systems. So what have we learned from that? Well, I mean, one issue with the hot Jupiters is that we don't think that they can have formed in situ. So we think that they have formed much further out from their star and they reach their current location through some large-scale uh, migration uh, processes. And there are two uh, competing mechanisms for this migration to occur. One is the uh, disk migration that is uh, due to the gravitational interaction between a planet and its uh, protoplanetary gaseous disk. And this disk migration is a natural source of aligned hot Jupiters. Well, there are, of course, some exceptions to this uh, general expectation. Uh, one uh, possibility is that the, uh, it is possible that the uh, protoplanetary disk gets misaligned due to the gravitational interaction with some nearby stars, although it remains to be 
uh, seen whether the whole list will get misaligned or not. And this has been uh, recently pointed out by uh, Batigini and collaborators that maybe the recent uh, measurement of the uh, projected obliquity of 55 Cancri E, which is a hot superus uh, in a system of five planets, is maybe a, a good candidate for this mechanism to happen due to the uh, presence of a nearby stellar companion to that system. It is also possible that uh, planets are formed and retain a small obliquity over time and that the tidal and that the uh, stellar spin axis gets tilted or gets shifted over time, which can, for instance, arise due to star planet tidal interaction. Uh, there is a second mechanism for migration to take place, which is a high eccentricity migration, which may arise from uh, dynamical processes like planet-planet scattering or um, secular interaction with a distant stellar companion, like for instance the Kozai mechanism. So this high eccentricity migration, if followed by efficient tidal secularization, is actually a natural source of misaligned hot Jupiters, and it may give rise to planets with a broad range of obliquities depending on the efficiency of the excitation mechanism and depending on the efficiency of tidal uh, interactions to reduce obliquities or not. And so talking about that, it has been uh, pointed out recently, quite interestingly enough, that maybe all hot Jupiters were formed by the high uh, eccentricity uh, scenario, therefore being born with a broad range of obliquities. And uh, to account for the apparent excess of aligned hot Jupiters around cool stars, then it's been proposed that tidal interactions are efficient around cool stars to reduce planet obliquity. So this has been proposed by TRIO and collaborators, Albrecht and collaborators. And so these guys, uh, they constructed a tidal theory, which is mostly based on Jopold's dance uh, theory for the tidal synchronization of compact binary stars. And so they showed that uh, there is indeed a correlation between a tidal realignment time scale and the uh, star's effective temperature, which goes in the right direction or goes towards the observed trend. Now, in a quantitative way, it turns out that the tidal realignment time scale that can be inferred is uncomfortably long compared to the edge of the systems, which I think that show the limitations in applying Zan's theory of uh, the tidal evolution of compact binary stars to the tidal evolution of short tidal extra planetary systems. Well, now that being said, uh, it has stimulated much work to try and better understand star planet tidal interactions, and in particular, the conditions for tidal realignment to occur on a time scale that is shorter than the tidal migration time scale have been investigated, including by Dong Lai in the audience, with the uh, prediction that if all aligned hot Jupiters were actually born with a random obliquity and were tidally realigned due to star planet tidal interaction, then we would expect both a population of prograde and of retrograde planets, that is with zero and 180 degrees for the projected obliquity, which is not what is observed. So I think this sheds light on the fact that maybe actually most aligned hot tributaries were born with a zero obliquity and kept that zero obliquity over time. So to finish with the first part of my talk, I would like to just briefly mention the recent work by Krida and Batijin, who compared the uh, observed distribution of projected obliquities with the uh, statistical predictions of two different misalignment scenarios. One on the left-hand side is this disk misalignment scenario due to the interaction with nearby stars. And the one on the right-hand side is the uh, different models of high eccentricity migration plus a tidal friction model. And I think that the takeaway messages from these two plots is that both mechanisms can actually kind of successfully reproduce the observed trend beyond some obliquities, say beyond 30 to 40 degrees but that both mechanisms tend to underpredict the number of aligned hot Jupiters. So I think that some partial conclusions that can be drawn from this is that we still need this migration to account for the number of aligned hot Jupiters and that the current observations cannot, at least cannot yet, disentangle between uh, different misalignment uh, mechanisms. 
So now, moving on to um, uh, the multiple entry systems that have been uh, detected by uh, transit methods and most especially by Kepler, um, one very useful piece of information to study the dynamical evolution of these guys is to look at the observed distribution of the pair ratio between pairs of planets in a given system, which is shown in this plot, with dashed line showing the location of different uh, resonant ratios. And maybe quite surprisingly enough, we see that uh, there are many planet pairs that are not in resonance. First, there's a broad distribution of pair ratios. And the second thing is that those planet pairs that are close to resonant ratios, they appear to be just wide of resonance, that is, with a period ratio that is slightly greater than the uh, resonant ratio. Um, well, um, interestingly, although there's uh, much less statistics involved here, there can be some similar trend when looking at only uh, planet pairs that have been detected, that have been uh, obtained by radial velocity uh, technique, especially near the two to one mean motion resonance. Um, but before going back to this, uh, this uh, structure of the pair ratio distribution near resonant ratios, uh, I would like to point out the recent work by Jason Stephan, who argued that it's possible that some of the unexpected pair ratios in the observed distribution could be due to some unseen uh, companion in a planetary system that is seen uh, by trend in a small inclination uh, that is naturally arising from planet-planet interactions could lead to at least one of the planets not being uh, detected. And I'm showing here a cartoon with uh, an example of a, a weird pair ratio that can be obtained uh, with this uh, mechanism. So uh, going back to uh, this uh, structure of the pair ratio distribution near resonant ratios, um, so uh, several models have uh, tried to understand uh, this feature. Uh, one model is the uh, in-situ growth of planets in a gas-free environment. And um, what is important to bear in mind is that observations tend to um, actually um, favor the in-situ growth not of planet decimals, but in-situ growth of planetary embryos with probably a mass of the order of the Earth. Uh, we'll probably hear a little more about that in the next talk. Um, and um, maybe some of these planet embryos have actually been delivered by some initial phase of this migration. So this is, uh, this is ongoing work by Hansen and Murray, and uh, whose end-body simulations uh, reported in this plot show that where well, there are some um, features in the, pair ratio dis in the simulated pair ratio distribution that share some analogies with the observed uh, trend, especially near resonant ratios. Um, another mechanism that has been proposed is also the uh, tidal dissipation uh, occurring in uh, resonant planet pairs. And if the innermost planet of a given planet pair is sufficiently close to its whole star, then tidal dissipation can lead to some sort of a repulsion of a planet pair with the pair ratio increasing over time by some amount. And this might account also for this uh, this uh, observed trend that planets tend to be just wide of resonance. However, this requires uh, tidal dissipation to be efficient, and this requires the planets to be sufficiently close to their whole star. And if you look at the uh, pair ratio distribution with only planet pairs where the innermost planet is orbiting beyond 10 days, then, well, although there's not that many planet pairs concerned, we see that there is some a uh, similar trend with uh, planet pairs tending to be slightly uh, a way of uh, resonant period ratio. So I think this is showing that um, tidal dissipation may not be the only mechanism to uh, account for this opposite feature. And another mechanism that I've actually been working on is the possibility that disk migration could also explain uh, these kind of features. Uh, the important point here to remind is that it is often thought that disk migration can only lead to planetary pairs being in mean motion resonance. Well, this is actually not true, and in particular for the planets detected by Kepler with super to Neptune mass planets orbiting quite close to their star, it is expected that such planets might open partial gaps 
around the orbit in, this, in the protoplanetary disk, as this is illustrated here. And these will actually bring the good conditions for these planet interactions to also lead to a repression of a planet pair with a planet's orbital pair ratio increasing over time. Uh, so which brings me to uh, my conclusions. So I will conclude saying that the uh, many planet detections uh, that we got from transit methods have really highlighted that there are many mechanisms that contribute to the orbital evolution of uh, planetary systems. And that clearly, as we've seen for the uh, hot Jupiter, there, it is very unlikely that there is a single mechanism that might account for the diversity of uh, the planetary parameters. And also it has shed light on the importance of uh, better understanding stellar evolution and including stellar physics and stellar evolution in models of planetary evolution. And of course, more observations will uh, better constrain evolution models. And I thank you. Okay, thank you. Questions? Sasha? Thank you, Blanc. I have a question. In, uh, in our uh, solar system, uh, the evolution of planets have been uh, followed by a very long time scale. I mean, Earth is rotating in one year, and we have a 4.5 billion year Earth. So in terms of dynamical time scale, as you know, like it's a case for Saturn's ring, it's a, a very evolved and old dynamical system in terms of revolution. And so I was wondering, in the system you were discussing, how, uh, how long it takes to actually get into the resonance? And are we getting uh, a bias toward young system where uh, this resonance could not have been uh, installed? Or if getting into resonance is a very fast process, and we are pretty sure that if it were to be resonance, we had uh, enough evolution of the system that we are observing to have been there. You see my point? There are lots of questions, actually, in your question. Uh, well, uh, I mean, depending on what mechanism gives rise to this resonance structure, that can go actually quite fast. I mean, if the uh, resonance structure is obtained uh, already from the early stages of planet evolution in a disk, then you can get a resonance structure kind of fast. That is, uh, by the lifetime of a protoplanetary disk, which is typically between 1 to 10 million years. And then after that, other dynamical processes occurring on some longer time scales can actually uh, either uh, depart a planet pair from a resonant structure or, or not, depending on you know these dynamical processes. Uh. The questions? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it seems to me that the models that try to explain why there are some um, systems close to the resonance uh, concentrate on systems close to the first order resonance, like 3 to 2, 4 to 3, 2 to 1. Uh, do the higher order resonances use the same methods, like 5 to 2 or things like that? Um, that's a good point. Um, let me think about it. Um, well, I mean, one issue with the um, with second order resonance is that you first need the right conditions to get captured into these uh, into these resonances. Is, is that your point? Right? Like, for instance, the three to one resonance or these five to three and, and so on, right? Um, so, I mean, first you need the right conditions and the right eccentricity of the planet to get to that eccentricity first, uh, but. Once you get captured into this resonance, then all the dissipation mechanisms that I've presented, I mean, either the tidal evolution or even this planet interaction, they can actually uh, lead to a departure from, uh, from that resonance. So I would expect these mechanisms to operate as efficiently uh, for uh, second order resonances as for, I order, for first order resonances. Thank you. Okay, so thank you again, Clément. Thanks. Thank you.